That's done. Oh no, we're right. Dodgy switch on this. Okay, we're very slightly late, so without further ado, I will introduce Keith Packard, who will speak to you on the future of Linux graphics. Thank Good afternoon. you. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, I'm, my throat's a little hoarse today, so if I speak a little quietly, just remind me and I'll try to speak up. Um, so I'm going to talk about the direction that we're trying to take in Linux graphics uh, in a lot of different areas. Uh, the, the, the key that we're planning to do here is we're trying to integrate things together in a way they haven't been up to date. Um, Linux graphics runs on Linux in a lot of different environments. We have graphic, we have, obviously have Linux desktop. I mean, how many of you are running the X server and the, the usual graphics Linux desktop, yeah? Uh, or BSD. <laughs> Um, and that obviously runs on workstations, laptops, and occasionally on a server if you're crazy. And then Linux runs in a lot of mobile devices. How many of you have a mobile Linux device in your pockets, Android or, or a Nokia device or something like that? Yeah? How many of those are running X? Well, the Nokia runs X. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. The Android devices don't, though. And uh, that's for some reasonably good reasons. Um, it, uh, not running X obviously saves a bunch of memory and uh, lets them make all the applications uh, distinct from other platforms. Um, and obviously there are a, a growing uh, number of Linux tablets right now. You see things like um, uh, the, uh, the, the Nook and other uh, Linux uh, e-readers, and you see um, uh, Intel uh, ARM-based and Intel-based uh, Linux tablets. Um, and all those are, many of those are running X, um, a lot of those are not. A lot of those are running Android, obviously. Um, and, we see, and we're starting to see a growth of Linux in, in media. How many of you have a television at home that's running Linux? Yeah. Are any of those running X? Not so much. Not so much. How many of you have a car that has a Linux machine in it? BDL. <laughs> BDL, you have a Suburban. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, even, even your little GPS devices. I have a TomTom Tom GPS on my dash. It's running Linux. Um, and then there's, you know, a huge array of embedded Linux systems all over the planet from McDonald's signage to billboards to, you know, in-store stuff and medical systems in your hospital are all running Linux. Um, a huge range of those. Some of these are running X and some of these aren't. And one of the big problems we've had as the open source community is basically not engaged in any area that's not X. That seems to me like a huge lost opportunity. I mean, we have a, a great opportunity to, to integrate and unify Linux graphics across all these devices and bring a lot of marginal open source players kind of into the fold, embrace and extend, right? <laughs> not at all, not at all. So one of, the, well, of course, one of the requirements is that nothing break. Well, that's always the hard part. We'll try, we'll try to see what we can do. So, you know, in all these environments, who actually wants X? The X ability to run applications remotely over the network, the X ability to interact with uh, applications written in 1988, uh, the X ability to run Motif applications. Who actually wants that? Does anybody care if you can run Motif? You run <laughs> Motif. <laughs> The, the dominant use today in the Linux environment of X desktops is because the two dominant toolkits, GTK Plus and Qt, both use X in the Linux environment. Now, obviously, both of these also have additional uh, backends that don't use X. Uh, but in terms of acceleration uh, on, the, on a regular Intel laptop or something, obviously, you're going to be running X because that's how you get at the acceleration. Aside from the Linux desktop market, which wants to use X because that's how you get at acceleration, Nobody really cares. Telephones, TVs, cars, nobody cares about X. So instead of, instead of resisting the other environments and saying, no, you all have to run X so that you can join the open source fold, um, I'm suggesting that we, we embrace them and extend our notion of the Linux desktop graphics environment uh, to embrace uh, a broader swath of the, uh, of, the, of the environment. Now, in the Linux in ecosystem, uh, what are the useful rendering APIs? Uh, note which is distinctly missing here. <laughs> the most useful rendering, rendering API in the Linux ecosystem is OpenGL. The, all of your high-speed applications, anything that wants to actually go fast, uses OpenGL. The other, the other um, APIs that I put up here are uh, via API or VDPAU or what's the Radeon one? 
X D. Okay, Th those get at the native media decode hardware in a nice in a nice way. Obviously, X doesn't natively support any of those. These all get at the native hardware efficiently, uh, unlike say the X protocol, which has wide lines and arcs. So what are we using X for right now? We're using it for controlling the hardware. You know, we use it for mode setting. We use it for 2D graphics because we don't have anything running on GL today, maybe tomorrow. Uh, we obviously want, uh, we have to have an input demultiplexer. Your, your mouse and your keyboard are essentially a multiplex stream of input d events uh, being targeted at multiple applications. So you need some semantic demultiplexer to take all this, uh, this, un, this unidirectional stream of input events and divide it out among all the applications. We use it for keyboard mapping because keyboards are a nightmare. Um, and obviously we use it right now, uh, the traditional X system uses it for uh, allocating screen real estate. Uh, and we do that in the traditional X system with clipping. Um, and the other thing that we use X for in the, in the Linux ecosystem is for uh, the shared GLX required um, objects between multiple applications. So if you have uh, two applications rendering GL to the same window, then they're supposed to share the back buffer, which by the way is insane. That just should not be allowed. Um, so why was X in charge of graphics? How did we get to the state where we don't have any native kernel support for credible graphics? Well, the main reason was mode setting. If you look at the other uh, competing graphics systems in the open source space that have come along over the years, they've all come up against this wall. They would, be, they would work on Matrox and then they'd stop. Or they'd work on Mach 64 and then they'd stop because the hardest part about starting a graphics system, just to get it running at all, is getting the video card lit up and painting pixels on the screen. There used to be an enormous pile of code. Fully three quarters of the Intel 2D driver was mode setting. You know, it's, it's just a huge amount of information and hacks over the years. Duplicating that in another system is just totally intractable. There's no way you're going to get it to be as compatible. Um, and of course, the other thing X was doing was clipping. Right, you'd allocate some screen real estate. And X was the only one who knew where, what the window stacking order was and what the clipping regions for each window were supposed to be. Um, the great part was that DRI tried to hack around this and it actually shared the clip list between the X server and the application so the application could do its own swap buffers. And that meant that your DRI application had to lock the desktop, including the entire X server, paint a scene and then unlock it. This was the old DRI-1, or D, the, core, the original DRI extension, uh, where it actually had a lock that was passed between applications to the X server. So you run your application under GDB and hit a breakpoint, and your X server is frozen. It's awesome. Um, and the other thing that X was used for is for memory management. Right? You got all these, uh, you have PIX maps, and you have off-screen, you, you have all this off-screen memory in your video card. Somebody has to be in charge of allocating it and managing the, the region of space in the video card. And the X server used to do that. It used to partition out the video memory so that 3D had this part and your media acceleration had this part and your PIX maps were allocated over here. And X got to do that. The best part about this was that DRI applications had no persistent on-card state. So if you wanted to render temporary images in DRI 1, not so much. Kind of made us limited in our GL support. Um, let's see. Uh, external window management. So X is not just a single server. It's actually a collection of servers now. Right? You have your X server, which does all the management of the uh, clip lists and the fundamental access to the graphics card. And then you have your window manager, which is another application that controls where the app, where, uh, that moves windows around on the screen and, and uh, paints title bars and, and pops up menus occasionally. And then you have your external compositing manager, which is what, what these days we use for all of our fancy on-screen uh, on effects. And so you have a, a system of interconnected servers it's kind of like the mock microkernel, right? You have these interconnected servers interoperating with, how many of you think that's a great architecture for operating systems? Yeah, not so much. So that's, what, that's where we are at X. And why does it have to be this way? Well, because we want the window manager and the compositing manager to run an unprivileged space. And when the X server is talking to your hardware directly, it's running as root. And so we're trying to keep the amount of privileged code in the system to a minimum. And so we externalized all this stuff with these very complicated protocols, the damage protocol and all the synchronous grab mechanisms so the window managers can, you can click in a window and start typing right away and the window manager uh, has a, a synchronous grab and then sets the focus so that when your typing goes to the right window. Extremely complicated. 
And it's made the system very fragile over a long time because application programmers have to be aware of all of this. How many of you have written your first application where you map a window and then paint to it and nothing appears on the screen? Yeah, exactly. This, the dumbest possible X application doesn't actually paint anything on the screen because it's asynchronous. <laughs> That's insane. Okay, how have things changed? Well, how many of you were writing graphics applications in 1985? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's a couple of us. Back then, Unix, because we didn't have Linux yet, didn't have shared libraries. And so if you wanted to share code, you either put it in the Unix kernel, which is what we did in V7. We started putting all the terminal drivers and all this crap in a Unix kernel. Or you stuck it in a server, which is a lot of what BSD started to do with your mail server and your FTP server and all these various services. Um, and you talk to the server to get some service done. It's like Dbus, right? There's an external Dbus server instead of a shared library. A lot of that's for security reasons, but also a lot of that was this historical architecture where Unix didn't have shared libraries, and the only way to share code across applications and take advantage of your massive one megabyte of memory was to externalize a lot of the functionality of the system into a shared server. So that's why the X server has all the rendering code in it, right? Not because, not because we think it's great to have uh, rendering done in the X server, it's, it's useful, but also because it was the only way to share the code between applications. Um, since 1985, the amount of data that you pump onto your screen has changed dramatically. We used to paint stuff like this. You know, a couple of rectangles, a little tiny logo, and a bunch of text. The X protocol is fabulous at that. You know, that, that's, probably, you know, that's probably 200 bytes of X protocol data to paint that screen, except for the image, right, which is probably you know, 10 kilobytes all by itself. Right? So X was fabulous at this, but how many of you have a solid black background on your desktop? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, not so many. How many of you have a nice picture of a friend or you know, some important event in your life? Yeah, exactly. Huge amounts of data. And how many of you run 3D applications that might have more than one texture that's full screen size? Yeah, so, what? Screen size is a Screen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, screensavers. Yeah, screensavers just hammer the machine with huge amounts of data, both in terms of vertices and textures. Right, we're, we're getting dramatically more detail on the screen in every every possible way, um, and we have this new remote application access protocol that's really powerful: HTTP and HTML. Right, you can run form fill out applications and all the way up to all the way up to Flash applications over this fine new protocol. Um, it's you know the modern equivalent of the IBM 3270. I, I was in a I was in a shop a couple of weeks ago, and I actually saw somebody running an IBM 3270 emulator on their PC to do their daily work. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. The other cool thing is we have themable UIs now. We have some notions about how theming works, and it is possible to get a pretty consistent look and feel across multiple toolkits. Windows is famous for this. If you look at Windows, the applications look consistent. That's not because they're all using the same toolkit. It's because somebody spent a bunch of time making all the toolkits look alike. Um, and making things fast enough is, is a lot easier today. Right? All the, the notion of all the fancy asynchronous grab mechanisms and all this delayed mouse motion, mouse motion history stuff, we don't actually need a lot of that anymore. And, and oh, by the way, in 1985, I had a black and white screen. <laughs> Yeah, I'll bet they do. Yep. Yep. So what I want to talk about is reintegrating the Windows system. I want to simplify the system architecture by pulling all these, all these separate servers into a single common server, integrate the compositing manager, integrate the window management, and uh, provide synchronous operations entirely within a single address space and with a single application, dramatically easing the development of these systems and making things you know, giving a nice imperative programming model instead of this event-driven model, which is very confusing and difficult to deal with. Obviously, when we reduce the number of uh, processes, we're going to improve performance because you don't have to context switch. So you're right now, when you click a button, um, when you click a button and paint something new on the screen, you've got like three processes involved. You've got the application, which sends the rendering commands to the X server, uh, or directly to the card, um, which paints it in off-screen memory, which sends an event to the compositing manager, which then composites that into the final screen image. You've got the huge number of applications involved in a lot of context switching. Uh, questions obviously remain. Um, how do we deal with um, 
broken applications, what happens if an application locks up the hardware? Right now, with 2D applications, the 2D X protocol is not programmatic at all. Right? You draw lines, and you draw text, and you draw rectangles. It's nice and confined. So applications have no ability in the X protocol to lock up the hardware, unless you draw wide arcs. And that just takes a long time, which is really uh, di different, I promise. And the other question is, what do we do about, you look at Compiz. Compiz has how many plugins? 200, 300 plugins now? People obviously want a lot of shiny in a lot of ways. I don't know what to do about that, other than tell them you're insane. OK, so what do we do about remote applications, right? We obviously, obviously, this is a nice solution for, uh, for native applications. You do direct rendering, um, and then you have a shared compositing manager, uh, compositing manager window system, integrated system. And that puts the stuff up on the screen. Um, well, for the typical form fill out application, like filing your LCA registration, uh, did you use an X application for that? Yes, you used your browser. <laughs> but the actual network protocol was over HTTP. So a lot of stuff that we use X for today, uh, the old ancient motif applications that just had a bunch of forms, most of that is migrating to, to, to HTML today. Uh, we obviously have VNC and our desktop, which are nice protocols that just do screen scraping and pumping the data over the wire. Um, the smallest representation for complicated 3D systems is usually the final pixels. Because that, that, that you don't have to send extra texture levels or anything like that. You don't have to send the multiple the changes in vertices. You just send the pixels. It's also nice and consistent. You know how many pixels there are. You can set a specific bandwidth and you get a specific quality on the screen. It's nice and consistent. Now, you can use a server resident GPU. Um, fortunately, the new Intel CPU, uh, CPU GPU combination Sandy Bridge, lets you render into cacheable memory. So, this whole notion of GetImage being slow has gone away. Um, so, at least you can do that. Obviously, not going to work so well if you want to do 50 users on the same system running 3D applications. But we run 50 users running simple 2D applications using VNC or our desktop quite easily. Um, the other, the other uh, protocol that Intel's been working on is something called WiDi, which is basically a wireless display. Uh, so you run your, your, you run your server on your laptop, and you display it on a remote screen. It's really just a screen. It's not a computer at all. Well, of course, it's a computer. Everything's a computer. But it really is just, it looks just like a screen. And so you can paint your application image over, the, over a, even a wireless connection. And that uses, you know, reasonably lossy um, compression. Uh, maybe something like JPEG 2000. I don't actually know. I haven't looked at it. Um, and that works. That would be great for the presentation environment in here, right? I wouldn't have to try to plug in and hope that the VGA is going to work. Um, and of course, you can still run X, right? If you if you think that your application needs to be reloadable, there's no reason you can't run X. X is happy to run in this environment. It's just another application that paints stuff on the screen, and it can expose a network socket, and you can paint paint your stuff over X. Um, and the best thing about that is that the performance of your X applications will be unchanged. Because right now, X is just a DRI application that paints stuff using the same DRI infrastructure that your 3D applications do. So when we move to a system where X is a separate server running as an unprivileged user, your performance won't change. Obviously, the cool part, uh, OK, so I want to be able to provide some broad uh, system architecture support. Um, obviously, when it, we need to provide mode settings so I can play with a lot of different systems here. I need to provide input access. And we need to provide some rendering and memory management. All these things need to be in a shared area, right? And all of these need to be privileged. Now, what's our privileged environment in the Linux system? Yeah, it's the kernel, right? So we've stuck all these things into the kernel. And now, all of a sudden, all of my graphics applications can run unprivileged. All the graphics applications have access to these fundamental Linux infrastructure, which is the privileged environment. So I don't have to run the X server running as root, poking I.O. registers directly from user space. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> now, the nice thing is that these particular interfaces aren't really Linux specific, right? There's nothing in these interfaces that are, that are specific to Linux. We can port these interfaces to other operating systems. And that means that once you have these, uh, once you have these uh, interfaces in your other operating system, the other services will just work. So it also gives us, it, it gives us a similar level of, app, of uh, operating system portability, although not quite as much, because now I have to port it into the kernel instead of just mmapping my device and writing to the raw registers. So what are the missing pieces? What do we need to make this happen? You know, we have a bunch of infrastructure available. One of the big parts we have, are missing right now is keyboard mapping. Uh, the keyboard mapping is extremely complicated in X. Um, uh, Daniel gave a talk. Um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Plumber's Minicon a couple days ago and laid out the complexity of keyboards. 
And every time he does that, it's like, you've got to be kidding. Somebody designed this? They must have been on drugs. Um, so fortunately, uh, Daniel and uh, Christian Hoaxberg are working on pulling all of this XKB stuff out of the X server into a shared library. So we'll be able to share the X key mapping in user space, not in the kernel, uh, the X key mapping and, and event processing infrastructure for keyboards between X and other Windows systems. Um, input drivers, the EVDEV infrastructure is really not sufficient. Uh, EVDEV gives you a very low level uh, view of the system. And when you talk about touch devices with multiple touch points, there's a huge amount of uh, complexity there that we're going in uh, in the multi-touch stuff in X right now. Um, I'm treating the multi-touch stuff at X as kind of a prototype of how we want the stuff to work in a real system which won't involve X. And so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how it works because I don't expect it's going to last that long. I'm hoping to bail on the whole X stuff sooner than that. Um, but it is interesting to note that we're getting some pretty well-defined semantics that are totally independent of the Windows system and not dependent upon the X grab nightmare infrastructure at all. Another, another big piece is the uh, accessibility in APIs. Um, back in the 1990s, uh, we had a whole bunch of work on accessibility in X in terms of uh, the XKB extension for sticky keys and mouse keys and all that kind of stuff. And more recently in the, in the GTK and QT systems, we had a, uh, had a bunch of work in accessibility for those in terms of color schemes and, and, uh, and uh, alternate input methods. Um, so those need to be integrated into the new system. Obviously GTK and QT, those systems should just port over but certainly the XKB infrastructure will need to be moved as well. And that has to go into the Windows system um, or into the input demultiplexer part of the Windows system. Um, obviously, we want to make it flexible. Right now, X is kind of a huge, ungainly beast. Um, we have deleted a lot of code in the X server in the last five years or so. I think we've deleted uh, well in excess of 500,000 lines of code from the X server. Has anybody noticed? <laughs> Thanks for managing my problem for me, Linus. No, actually, that was just the core X server. That wasn't the device drivers. That was just the core X server, with none of the none of the uh, none of the stuff related to devices at all. Uh, it's plus on half of the core server. No, that five hundred thousand lines have been removed from the core server. Yeah. Yeah. So, has anybody noticed any reduction in functionality? I lose keystrokes now. I haven't used it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I used to be able to type kill minus 9, whatever process it was. Now, it'll just have to kill minus 9 1, which is... <laughs> Not so useful. <laughs> yeah. Um, th those, are, those are obviously bugs in the keyboard infrastructure that we're trying to fix. Uh, when, when Hootie and Daniel were changing input infrastructure to support multiple pointers and multi-touch, uh, they may have broken some stuff. We're trying to fix them. But, so we're trying to make the X system smaller, but we still have like a half a million lines of code in the X server that doesn't do much. Um, obviously, we're trying to move from X ecosystem APIs like GLX uh, to more generic APIs like EGL. Uh, we're trying to extend our GL support from just OpenGL to also support GLES. Uh, fortunately, the Mesa project does that now, so we can actually write GLES applications that run on top of GLX or EGL, and those work in the X environment or in a not X environment. And we're moving from these very X-centric uh, media APIs like XV and XVMC into DRI APIs that aren't specific to X. So applications that use these new media APIs won't be, that part of the application won't be dependent upon X. So we're reducing the amount of X-specific code already in applications. The goal is to make it easier for applications to transition to a non-X environment if they choose, or to continue running in X if they want to do that. There's no need. No need to move if you don't want to. And obviously, you want to mix and match, X and non X. If you want to run legacy X, X, X applications, we'll still have an X server available that will draw your lovely X stuff on the screen uh, with loving care of every pixel placed just so. OK, so the original goals of the composite extension were to provide for fancy desktop effects, right? We wanted, to make, we wanted to add the shiny to the X system. We wanted to eliminate exposed events. And we wanted to use it for. Um, we wanted to use render for uh, drawing the stuff. The original plan was just use render for all the, all the, uh, all the actual on-screen drawing. We're going to draw some shadows, a little Gaussian blurs, blah, blah, blah. Um, the additional results of the composite extension are that windows no longer do clipping, right? A window is drawn off-screen, the full size of the window. 
There's no clipping to siblings or to its parents' geometry or anything. So all of a sudden, applications can render directly to an off-screen buffer with, and to be totally ignorant of the window system clipping. The only thing it needs to do clipping is a compositing manager when it stuffs stuff on the screen. Um, and the, also, the other nice thing is that now we have most of our compositing managers use GL. And so the screen contents are not even, don't even, the screen update doesn't even go through the X server. It's all done with DRI. So the X server, so the application paints the DRI to an off screen buffer and then tells the X server I've updated this off screen buffer, which tells an application, the compositing manager, the buffer was updated. And the compositing manager uses DRI to paint. So the only thing going through X right now is the notion that a buffer contents have been changed. That's it. No rendering goes to the X server, no nothing. Um, the GEM uh, uh, kernel API, the original goals of that were to you know, fix the, fix the uh, kernel infrastructure so I could actually per, uh, have persistent off-screen storage for graphics objects. And in order to have persistent storage, obviously the objects have to be pageable because otherwise you have any application can DOS the system just by running enough memory. And that's not good. I wanted to be able to do zero copying from a texture to a pix map and from a pix map to a texture. I wanted to be able to do the fancy compositing effects without having to shuffle pixels around. Um, and I wanted, obviously, to have these, I wanted to have persistent storage, right? Our old DRI infrastructure, if the 3D application wanted to have an FBO, <laughs> you rendered that in software and painted it meticulously with the CPU. Um, and the other cool part about GEM was that I wanted to be able to share objects between rendering APIs. So I wanted to share the output of X rendering with a GL application. I wanted to share the output of a, a media application with GL or X. And so all of a sudden, I needed what I wanted is a global namespace of uh, bags of pixels. And so you have a GEM buffer object, which is just a bag of pixels uh, in a graphics, in a hardware-specific manner. It's got all the information that the hardware needs to know in order to use and render to it and from it efficiently. The additional results of the GEM infrastructure, DRI2, is that now I have lockless rendering, right? Applications don't need to lock the X server uh, to do any rendering because there's no clipping involved. They own their buffer, and it's a, a separate buffer from the rest of the applications on the screen. So they can just render to that totally oblivious of the X server and not interacting with it at all until it's all done and ready to be put up on the screen. Um, Direct rendering applications, obviously, the, their output is persistent. So if you render to a buffer, the system doesn't care where that buffer is, if it's on screen or off screen. It's an object that the application owns. And so the, the uh, pixels don't go away until the application destroys it. And obviously, you can share these applications, uh, these objects between applications with the Windows system. And so right now, the way that you update the uh, screen um, is the application renders to the back, the application asks the X server to render a back buffer with GLX. The application draws to the back buffer, and then it tells the server to copy data from the back buffer to the front buffer. And that means the, the only involvement the X server has is the allocation that's required by GLX semantics, and then the final copy to the screen, which is where the clipping has to happen. Uh, kernel mode setting. Obviously, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make mode setting actually work. If you do mode setting, especially with modern devices like DisplayPort, or the new lovely Intel FDI flexible display interconnect. Um, it's basically impossible to do that from user mode because you have tight timing requirements uh, as you're doing the as you're doing the training. And so we really need to do that in kernel in the kernel space. Uh, the other thing we wanted to be able to offer was panic messages on the screen. How many of you have had your system freeze because the network card crashed? And you can't see the panic message because the X server can't paint anything and can't get out of the way to show the panic message. That really sucks. Well, because now we have DR, the J, uh, KMS in the kernel, the kernel can flip the screen to the console, and you can actually see your panic message. And I, that actually worked successfully for me the first time like six months ago. And it was like, whoa, what's that? Oh, yeah, it's supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah, oddly, my wireless card crashed. Um, the uh, un unfortunate thing, of course, is that if the video card crashes, you still don't get a stack trace. <sighs> Yeah, serial console. Yeah. O oddly, most of the crashes that I experience are because my video card is broken, because I, I run potentially unstable code. Uh, so the additional results here is that it's trivial to build a non-X window system. I mean, Christian Hoegsberg built Wayland in you know, uh, the initial mode setting part of Wayland in a couple weeks. And all of a sudden, he has a window system which is not dependent upon X and which supports everything that KMS supports with no additional work. A fabulous result. So all of a sudden, we have a migration path out of the morass of X and into a bright, shiny new future uh, where X is a, a potential API, but not a required API. 
And you could even build now windowless systems where you render directly to EGL on the entire screen. Uh, obviously, TVs might want to do this where you have a single application rendering all the contents on your screen. And so you can get rid of uh, the footprint of another Windows server and you know, a bunch of other infrastructure and uh, sh shrink the size of your flash image and whatever you want to do. So you can build systems that use a Windows system or don't. Um, EGL is an API that uh, was, uh, um, is, is a, an a alternate API for talking about Windows systems from GL. GL kind of has historically had this kind of nightmare API, which is specific to each operating system. They have WGL and they have AGL, WGL for Windows and AGL for the Apple system, and they have GLX for the X system. So every application that wants to port between various operating systems has to use a different API to talk about the Windows system. And it's worse than that because a lot of the objects that you need to allocate in the GL environment come out of this API. So you end up with a ton of Windows system specific code in your nominally portable GL application, which is a pain. And so uh, we have a new API called EGL. The goal was to make it so that you have portable cross-platform applications. Well, for us, it's great because we want to get rid of GLX. And so if applications are written to EGL, and I can run them in an X or non-X environment with very small changes to the applications. They need to talk to the new Windows system. And then they can use the EGL API to do the rest of their uh, Windows system interactions. So here's our old environment, uh, nearly done. Uh, where we had um, the X kind of owning the entire world, everything that you could ever possibly want to do with the system, and the poor little Linux penguin sitting there lonely at the bottom, its, its device address space mapped into the X server and its registers poked and its PCI buses prodded. It's feeling pretty sorry for itself. With all this stuff wedged into the X server, um, and all the various APIs are sitting on top of that, and they all go through X. And here's our new environment where we have all these APIs that talk directly to the Linux kernel, where Linux will make sure that the APIs are stable and consistent and, and uh, reliable. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my job gets a whole lot easier, because I'm just a has-been add-on, right? I'm just this little X add-on on the side. If you want to run some old, ancient, crufty motif applications, you might start an X server. So, and all of your other APIs um, uh, sit on top of that. And you can run whatever Windows system you want. You want to run Ray Wayland? You want to run X? You can do whatever you like. So are there any questions this afternoon? Thanks. Keith, we've got microphone. I'll just bring around. I'll put your hand up for you and answer a question. Thanks. How many people want questions? We'll get down the front because it's so packed if there's um, too many. Are you all looking nervous and shy or something? OK. All right, now don't hang on to it too long. Now, this will be real quick. I'm just wondering if this, uh, these changes will affect support for uh, secondary s screens. Uh, what, what do these changes affect the support for secondary screens? Yeah, not will, at will all. run cleaner or nicer? Or, or not at all. The nice thing about the, nice thing about the uh, gem infrastructure in the kernel is that all the video cards use the same API to user space. And so your applications will use a common API across all the video cards. Um, of course, one of the basic problems with direct rendering is that the different video cards have different capabilities. And so if you're using an a, a, a API that exposes the capabilities of the video card instead of X, which does not, uh, then your application is going to have to deal with the heterogeneity between multiple video cards. It has to do that already today for direct rendered applications. And so any GL application today, if you have two cards plugged into your system, it's going to run on one card or the other today. Um, there's a bunch of thought and talk about building a GL multiplexer that will, uh, that will expose a common subset of multiple GL cards. You can migrate stuff between cards. That's really hard. One of the other nice things is because the GEM API is common and you can share these objects between different graphics cards, you can actually paint on one screen and copy the contents to another screen, to a different video card. Obviously, there will be some performance implications of that because you'll actually have to copy the pixels. But at least it should work. So it's no worse than it is today for direct rendered applications. But the, of course, we are increasing the number of direct rendered applications, potentially. OK. Anyone else? Any more questions? You're blind. Oh, sorry. Here we go. <laughs> What's going to happen with licenses? With what? With licenses. Licensing. Yeah. Binary all, blobs. All of, all of the kernel code right now, uh, because it's part of the DRI project, is actually still licensed under the MIT license. So everything we put into the Linux kernel for mode setting and the gem infrastructure is all licensed with the BSD license, which is compatible with the GPL, so we can put it in the kernel without any license conflict there. But it also means that code has been 
ported to other non-GPL environments. Uh, NVIDIA's and um, ATIs who insist on shipping binary blobs? Oh, for binary blobs? I don't care about them. They are going to have a problem. Uh, right now, fortunately, we have open drivers for both of those cards that work in this environment just fine. So if they want to come and play with us, they're welcome to. But frankly, they aren't that important for the ecosystems that I'm looking at extending ourselves into. Right? We're trying to move into an ecosystem that's a much more embedded ecosystem. Um, and if they want to come and play there, that'd be great. They're welcome to uh, provide APIs that are compatible with ours and, and live with us and come play with us in the open source world. How does this work with authentication? At the moment, I can SSH to a remote machine and stuff just magically happens. And most days, I don't need to care about how it works. It can display on my screen. If we have multiple different systems for this, how is that going to work? Well, for a remoting, uh, as, I, as I talked about, the remoting, the remoted display APIs that, I've, uh, that, I, that I talked about were X, HTTP, and VNC, and those all have existing network authentication mechanisms available. So if you want to remote, a app, remote an application over the wire, then you're going to use one of those existing systems, possibly X, uh, to remote your application. And that already has kind of a broken authentication mechanism. Okay, over here, couple. Uh, how has uh, color management uh, changed in the new structure? Uh, right now, X supports just this huge array of colors, uh, uh, video card capabilities, uh, monochrome and grayscale and pseudo color. Um, <laughs> <laughs> those are awesome. How many user? How many of you are running an application in other than true color mode? B-Dale. <laughs> B-Dale has ancient hardware. So the only thing we effectively support today is true color, right? And the only thing, the only thing you do in true color is change the gamma mapping, right? You can change the, 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 the mapping of input values to output values for each of the primaries. And that, that's continue, that is exposed over the KMS API. But I don't imagine people are going to be running pseudo color applications for much longer. Others? All done? We've got a few minutes spare, so. Thanks very much for coming up, out today. Very good. Well, all right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Keith. And as a token of appreciation, we have a bowl. Has everyone heard the story of the bowl? We've got a few spare moments. Okay, final time today. I'll tell you the story of the bowl. That's a uh, crushed macadamia nut bowl that was um, manufactured here in Brisbane for the conference. Yeah, it's rather nice. And the factory where that was made was actually flooded. Uh, it was actually being flooded as the bowls were being finished and dried, apparently, and shipped out the door. The story I tell is as the tables it was shipped on floated out down the river. And, and uh, it was very close to that, apparently. The factory totally flooded, so if there's any watermarks on it, they're genuine. Yeah. So thank you very much again, Keith. That was terrific. Well,